in three, two, one. How you doing? Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Thank you, I appreciate this. You want your one of these? I'm good, KG. You want your ginger shot? I'm good, man, I'm good. I need some positivity today. I'm trying to cover this spread, and your vibe is off, G. What's wrong with my vibe? You got to get you one of these, G. Get to sip some of this positivity in your life, and boom! You see that? Spread's covered. Thank you, Mama. In a minute, G. Ha ha! What y'all are doing, man? Uh, yeah, we're toasting to this. We're yeah, toasting to you guys. It. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is a moments of generosity toast to you guys, man, and what you guys created, man. I don't know. Uh, how you guys uh, pour y'all shots where y'all are, but I'm gonna just give a little bit. I don't wanna have nobody fall off the, the meter in here, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not a professional at pouring shots, so yeah, you know what I'm saying? Just wanna make sure that about even, that's all even, that's all even. About, about, about moments right. of generosity. Thank you guys for what y'all do, man. Seriously, salute, man. You, man. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Legendary. Mmm. Mmm. Shit, royalty. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have a specific moment in generosity in your career where you're like, you look back on and you're like, damn, like I really feel like gratitude towards this moment or someone you met or some of that influence? Anything. Yeah, for, for me, it's, um, it's um, you know, talking to my cousin who's incarcerated and um, mm. him telling me how the guys was running up on him in jail, like, yo, I heard your cousin is Rashad, Ernie Alicia. Oh, wow. And he like, how you know about Ernie Alicia? And he was like, yo, you got guys in here day trading crypto and mm. reading about real estate. So to see people under those, the worst possible circumstances that you can possibly think of, and for us to be providing hope and information to them, um, that's always really dope. So oh, that's cool. definitely, you know, all of the guys incarcerated to know that they actually are tapping in with us. I think that that's, that's something that's big. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's probably along those lines where every time we go outside, somebody's telling us that there's a piece of information that changed their life. And so that's something that, I mean, you hear it, and you just, you don't want to breeze over that. You don't want to take it for granted. And when it happens so many times, you can feel like there's something really happening here. There's something that's really changing. And so whether it's the mother who said, you know, I have my son watch y'all and take mm -hmm. notes every Monday, or it's the dad who says, look, me and my wife, instead of watching Monday Night Football, we watching y'all oh, because wow. this is going to change our life. I think that level of generosity, right? Because what we do it, we do it just for the love. We do it to say, like, we learn something, let's give it back. Um, moments like that, man, it's incredible. We had teenagers, you know, investing wow. through their parents in, in, in the stock market and saying, like, th this is something new. Right? I wish I, wish I would have knew this. How many times you hear that? Right. I wish I would have known this. And so, like, they don't have to wish anymore. The, the moment is here. Changing lives, man. Thank y'all for that, man. Thanks oh, for brother, sharing that. Seriously, brother. brother. Y'all do me a favor? Y'all sign the wall for me? Let's God do it. Got to. Got to. Thank you guys, man. Seriously, man. Appreciate it. Seriously, thank y'all, man. Nah, this is fun, man. Come on. Thank you, bro. Appreciate you. Man, thank y'all for coming here, man. Seriously. Oh, appreciate thank, it, thank man. Thank you for having it's us, no man. This, this, this is dope for us, man. It's nah, dope for us. This is dope for me, man, because I am a fan of not only education, but originality and script. And when I, when I, um, uh, I think before, uh, before the show, I want y'all to uh, meet my crew because we're fans of what you guys have created. You know what I'm saying? And my first question to you guys is, yeah, like, how did y'all create Earn Your Leisure? You want to start? Yeah, um, so he was a teacher and I was a financial advisor. Oh, okay. So financial literacy kind of goes hand in hand. So um, he actually, he was teaching in the Bronx. And he asked me to come speak to his kids. Mm -hmm. And I always was the type of person that hated school. Like, so when he, was, he decided to be a teacher, I just never understood that. Because that, to me, that's like an inmate breaking back into jail after he gets released. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, why would you want to go through your whole life <laughs> to go back? To go back. To go back right? Like, you know what I'm saying? So I wasn't really enthusiastic about it, honestly. But when I went there, um, 
it actually was a little more fun than I thought. Like, mm. You know what I'm saying? Talking to the kids, they was actually a lot more receptive to, I was talking about stocks and stuff like that, and I thought that they wouldn't care about it. And they was actually interested, asking me questions. So I'm like, oh, this is actually pretty cool. So he had a summer program every summer where it was a um, six-week program, and it was for kids that were too old for camp but too young to work. Oh, wow. So, you know, that's like a dangerous age because it's like 13. You all, you're out of school for eight weeks. You can just get caught up in a lot of nonsense. Very like, you know what I mean? Very so, impressionable age. Yeah, so the program was to um, give kids job internships mm. um, two days out the week, and then they went on a trip one day, and then there was two days in the classroom where they was learning. The citywide or just in the Bronx? This is not even in the Bronx. I was this teaching like in right the Bronx, outside. but it was where we lived in, in uh, Westchester, in Greenberg, yeah. our oh, town. Okay, okay. And so okay. it was like, it was called Crossroads because these kids were at the crossroads of their life. Oh, you know, wow. like at 14, Gosh. like you could really... <laughs> exactly. Gosh. And so it was like I had the advantage of seeing what wasn't being taught. I'm like, oh, we can implement the things that weren't being taught for 10 months within the next six weeks. And so we were paying the kids, and I was like, you got to come in. This is going to be perfect. If we're going to pay them, we know what's going to happen. We give them the money, they're going to spend it. Mm. Right? They, we wanted to teach them to have a relationship with money and have a positive one and, and see what you can do with it, use it as a tool, how you can save, how you can share, how you can spend, how you can invest. All the things that no one tells you. Mm. Like, even at 14, like, they didn't get it, but their parents didn't get it either. So it was like, all right, we have an opportunity here. So, like, while people were taking vacations and they were looking forward to the summer, I was looking forward to those six weeks. Like, all right, we got a chance. Because wow. people were just excited. Like, the kids were excited. Like, they wanted to be part of the program. And when it was over, they were like, how do we replicate this? How do we stay? How do we keep this thing going? And I just couldn't figure it out. I'm just like, all right, after they leave, they're going to get a job. Mm. But we get a new group of kids coming in. And so I was just like, how do I scale? How do I scale? And he had he had a great vision. Yeah, let's record it. So as we're teaching, I so as a financial advisor, my original plan is crazy. My original plan, I played basketball my whole life, right? right. So I wanted to go to the NBA like everybody else. Once I saw that that wasn't gonna happen, I'm like, all right, I want to be a financial advisor for athletes. Because mm. I was looking at the landscape, I'm like, all these guys that's financial advisors to athletes, they not really, they don't know the athletes. Like I'm really from the culture. Like I'm really mm. an athlete myself. So I'm like how can I market myself and become like a celebrity financial advisor? So I saw Instagram as a way to do that early. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, we're going to just start filming content and put it on Instagram. And we start filming classrooms. We start, I started doing a public access show, a bunch of stuff. So we're filming content as we're doing the, the crossroads. And then I'm doing my own thing on the financial planning side because my original plan was to grow an Instagram following to become real big on Instagram, and then I could work with athletes and mm. entertainers and be like the go-to financial advisor for the, for the whole culture. And as we doing that, this traction just started to build on Instagram, like, because mm. we were telling the backstories of sports and entertainment. So like the 50 cent vitamin water deal, kind of like breaking it down, right. or like Dipset Supreme, like yeah. breaking it down. So we was mm -hmm. talking about things that we already liked in the culture, which is sports and entertainment, um, but we were talking about the business side of it. The intangibles, too. You yeah. guys were great getting into it. Y'all was going detail for detail. Mm -hmm. I hate to use the word dumb it down, but, you know, respectfully. Because some of mathematics and yeah. some of business can be over your head yeah, if you're for not sure. educated, right? For yeah. sure. And I love the way it was simplified. I would use that word. Decoded. Yes. yes. Very much decoded. Appreciate Very that. Great yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. And so once the traction just started to build, it was like everybody thought, like, I had a show, because I would go on other people's shows and put mm. the clips up. So they're like, where can I watch your podcast? Where can I watch this show? I have a show. <laughs> so I hit him like, yo, you want to start a show? And he's like, yeah. So then we just kind of went back and forth on the name, decided on Earn Your Leisure. Um, and we put the show out. That was four and a half years ago. And as soon as we put it out, it's just Got been it. like wildfire ever since. Bro, I got a homie named Big Will. Shout out to Big Will. Got a a rare business on the super club in Atlanta called The Bank. When y'all go, y'all let me know. But I say this because he always says, man, I got it out the mud. And that's the first <laughs> thing I thought of when I thought of y'all. Yeah, yeah. Where does the spirit of education come from? You, you're a teacher. Where does that come from? Is, is that in your background? Is yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. When the first place we ever were employed was our community center. Mm. And so our coach was in charge of the community center giving kids jobs. Oh, okay. So if we played ball, we knew that we was going to have a job in the summer. And so that was my first introduction working with kids. And I'm like, this is, this is natural for me. Like, you know, sometimes you're doing something like for ball, just like no doubt, no doubt. some of these things are like God given. Like working with kids was my thing. I was like, this is easy. But I love sports. And I'm like, he's pretty good, right? Like, I'm probably like the, I'm starting, but like, these, I'm a role player. I'm not professional, like, professional athlete is not in my future. Gotcha. 
but I love sports. And so I was like, all right, well, if I can combine working with kids and sports, I, that's going to be my path. So I chose, I was a phys ed teacher. Oh, okay. I'm like, perfect, this is great. But I ended up, <laughs> this is great. I get to play all day. Like, this is going to be perfect. What ended up happening is they put me in the classroom and I had to teach health. I was like, yo, I went to school to not be in a classroom. But it actually worked to my advantage because it taught me classroom skills. It taught me lesson planning. It taught me classroom management, which was what I needed in the summer. Right? So I'm using those skills. I'm like, oh, wait, this is my purpose. And as we were doing that summer program, I'm telling you, I would work for 10 months and I wouldn't feel fulfilled. I'm like, there has to be something bigger. You'd be like, yo, you know, you, you're doing phys ed, but you, you're really better than that. Like, you, there's something greater for you. I'm like, yeah, we just got to figure it out, though. I got to figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. The six weeks, I was like, yo, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to teach kids about the things that the school doesn't, right? Because if I prepare them, imagine if they get information at 14, where they're going to be at 16, where they're going to be at 18, at 20. Whereas when we were there, it was like, figure it out, right? Go to school, Bye. figure it out. And sometimes kids figure it out in school, and it's too late. They're in debt. And we see that happen all the time. But the thing about school is, like, if you, if you start, you better finish <laughs> because there's going to be a bill coming in six months either way. So I'm like, let's give these kids the choices at 14. Let them see other professions outside of athletics. So if a kid comes to me and says, I want to go to the NBA, I tell them this is not the program. Right? You need to be in a camp. Right? In fact, if you're 14 at this stage and you're not, somebody hasn't recognized you yet, you need to work harder. So this might not be the program for you. But if you want to do other things, you want to be a pediatrician, an electrician, an architect, a teacher, I can help you with that. And two things are going to happen. Either you're going to be in that profession and say, this is what I want to do in my life, or I'm glad I got this experience. I don't want to do this. Either way, it's happening at 14 where it's not costing you any money. So I'm like, this is what we need to do. How much life experiences are y'all tapping into or are y'all taking in to be able to, um, to educate? Because that's a lot of it, too, what you go through, being able to speak on that. How much of your own gospel? Of your own experiences that y'all using? I mean, honestly, for me, you know what's crazy is that going to school my whole life, going to college, the biggest thing that I actually utilize in, in real life is what I learned from basketball. Mm. Like, everything that I learned from basketball, like, I remember I used to go to a prep school and my coach, he had a rule where if you was, if practice was at 3 o'clock and you came at 2.46, you was late. It was a 15, you had to come 15 minutes before gotcha. practice started. Yeah. I didn't fully understand that until now, where it's like, you can't prepare if you're just coming on time. So on time is actually late, right? Thanks. Learning how to work with a team, learning how to communicate, learning how to be a leader, learning how to deal with egos, learning how to, you know, get this person the ball just to kind of satisfy him in the moment, right? Like, that's the same thing that we do in business. Sometimes we just give somebody a certain situation, just kind of keep them happy. Um, it's so many different things that I learned that I apply now and that I apply to other people mm -hmm. based off of just playing basketball my whole life. And I feel like that's something that I didn't fully understand it. Like, you know what I mean? Because I was playing since I was eight years old to the time I'm 24 years old. But it's like that daily regimen, working out, getting up, eating right. Like, you know what I mean? Like all of those, the discipline, like, you know what I mean? Like not, not smoking, not doing a variety of other things that my friends was doing because I, I wanted to be a basketball player, even though... It didn't work out for me as far as that. It helped guide my life yeah. and helped me as far as, you know, my learning and, and teaching people. So for me personally, all of those things that I learned, all those valuable lessons I'm able to imply in my life and also give that game to other people as well. So y'all build this thing. You come to him. You say, we're going to start this thing. Y'all start it. It starts getting traction. What are y'all thinking? What are y'all thinking? It starts getting heavy traction. What are y'all thinking? Right off the top, go. Ah, uh, man, I'm thinking, all right. <laughs> what the fuck? No, I'm gonna be honest with you. I, was, I remember I was sitting, I was teaching a class. I had like kindergarten students in front of me. And him and our other partner, Mike, uh, they were already entrepreneurs. And so they're texting, they're going back and forth. I'm like, I can't focus on this because I got to make sure that these kids are so safe. you up here really teaching them. Like, ding! Yeah, 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 yeah. That's ding, me, that's ding. me. Like, I'm like, yo, fellas, Oh my God, something's going, ding, 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 we in a million, ding! It's crazy. And it's so going I'm, nuts. Exactly. I can't talk till 3 o'clock. I'm like... This is crazy. And then I saw a message, and it was somebody from Kuwait, and they talked about how an episode had impacted them. And I, like, right there, I was like... So you're literally two people. You're at lunch, kids <laughs> recess. You're on <laughs> your that. phone. And somebody from Kuwait oh is listening God. to what we're oh, saying shit. and how that episode impacted them. Oh, wow. And at that moment, I was like, you know, sometimes in life, you have to grow where you have the greatest impact. Like, I can impact this classroom and these kids and maybe the school district, but I can't impact kids in Chicago from here. 
I got to go where I have the greatest impact. And at the time we were starting it, I'm like, this is it. This is going to be the greatest impact I can have. And so everything became, I got to focus on this. So at lunch, I'm shooting ads, I'm editing, I'm reading. And I think that's one of the things you said, and this is important, your greatest attribute was your education. Like you were a student of basketball. I had to become a student of finance. Because they're looking at me like, I'm the phys ed guy. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm so much more than that, but they don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. And so I got to study this game. I got to master this game because as soon as I master something, this comes from education. I master it. Now my obligation is to teach it. And the only way to teach it is to have a full grasp on it. And so that's what I'm doing. Lunch breaks, when I get home, Saturdays, Sundays, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm sending them articles. But at the time I'm sending it to them, it's for our audience, but it's also for me. Because right. I got to figure this thing out. Well, now y'all building too, and y'all got a business. Exactly. And y'all are growing, and exactly. y'all are continuing to go forward, right? Get a great offer courtesy of KG Certified and BetMGM, the king of sports book. Sign up using bonus code KG1000, and you'll get back up to $1,000. Yes, $1,000 in bonus Bets if you do not win your first bet. BetMGM's parlay specials, daily odds, boost, and fan-friendly promos make it the best place to bet on all of your favorite sports. Download the BetMGM app today or go to BetMGM.com and enter your bonus code KG1000. Yes, KG1000. Nothing beats a W at BetMGM. My next question, man, where y'all get a lot of your information from? Just, just being in the rabbit hole, just... Chasing yeah, that? I mean, so a few different things. Um, so much information comes out on a daily basis now. Right. So like he he reads all of these different publications all the time, send it to mm. we watch CNBC, we talk to a lot of different good people too. That's another thing, like just being in an environment where just sharing information. Like we had the opportunity to talk to Robert Smith a couple different times. Mm. And every time we talk to him, he's just so saying so much stuff. And you might not even fully understand everything he's saying, but it's like I I remember it. I'm going home and go research. Yep. That's everything in the yeah. riddle, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is in the riddle, bro. Traditional well, it's business not, it's is in the riddle. Because we, we thought it was a riddle, right? And we, we, we sat down with Swiss the other day, and he was like, he felt like they were talking in a riddle intentionally. But he said something important. He was like, the only reason they're talking like this is because they don't want to make you feel like you're left out. Right? They don't want to make it seem like it's super over your head because then you'll run away. But as, the, as soon as they start talking in riddles, you're going to go home. If you have that type of character yeah, trait, yeah, you're going to figure this thing out. Because like that room that you just had, imagine they're having a conversation and you, don't, you can't have any input because you don't know the information. You we, can't be in the room then. You can't be in the room. Nice. And we're not going to be, we're going to be in the room. That's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> right? So we got to figure this out. Like, what do they mean by that? Okay, I got it. Let's figure this out and let's teach it to the people. Because if they're saying it here and the people down here can't understand it, who's the latter? Right. That became us. All right. And y'all are really the decoders. Y'all are actually adjoining cultures. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's, I really feel like when industries are built, it's built off, off that. And this is why you have a, such a surge on what you know versus what I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's a leverage. To me, that's the definition of leverage. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I told you earlier, it's based on y'all. Uh, for me, before there wasn't business in my house. So, you know, business was your contract, mm -hmm. Michael Jordan's contract, who's his, who's his agent. Sports became everything. It was like, that was business. Wow. How much did somebody get for that fight? What was Tyson's pay-per-views? Like, I'm reading New York Daily News, and I'm reading the back, like, oh, okay. Oh, wow. Six, was it six year, 121 million? Largest Yeah, I remember, I remember you got that. You know what I'm saying? Well, you were the Glenn Robinson the first to get a $100 million contract. Uh, Glenn Robb got 88. He you were the first. Eight. Glenn Robb got 89, no. Glenn Robb got uh, 89. The next summer, Larry Johnson got 84. I remember 12 for 84 from Knicks. Yep. I remember Larry Johnson yep, got yep, that. Yep, yep. Yeah. After Larry Johnson got that, um, uh, Alonzo Mourning got $100 million from the Heat. Hmm. Right after he got that, Shaq got the 120 from uh, Lakers. Lakers. And then uh, Jawan Howard got 105 the from Wizards. the Wizards. And then you. And then I came up next and got the 126, and then Timmy was supposed to get the 148. And they saw the surge in how we was going up in, um, in salaries. But what wasn't being talked about, and they let that be the narrative to come back and change the whole construction, what the uh, CBA was. Mm. Because what the owners wanted to do was control a network of money and control it the way they wanted to, which is what the league is. But the know. headline itself is a lot, because when like, we look at it, it's a narrative. Says, right, it's, it's a narrative, narrative that says, they want to sit everybody down. If I got 126 to give you, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You understand? But right, right. That's a fact. You know what I'm saying? But and, even 126 is like, that's over six years, right? right? And let's, nobody talks about the taxes. Nope. Nobody talks about that. Well, it's actually that. a good point. You yeah. actually brought up a, a very, it's very insightful what you just said. Because, yeah, you hear about, you always hear about the NBA contracts, 
But you never hear, like, there's no published report on how much money the Lakers brought in in 2023. Not even that. You don't even know the details of the contract, bro. You don't even know that. Every, matter of fact, uh, I'm going blank. I'm going to say 2015. Mm -hmm. from every contract from 2015 back to, let's say, let's say, I'm just going to say 2000, just so you don't have a, you know what I mean? <clears throat> every motherfucker that made or that was considered a, um, a max player had to pay 10% of his earnings back to the owner. They ain't gonna let no shit out like that. Now, where in the world would you work for somebody? <laughs> and at the end of the jump, turn around and get a brand that he paying you back to him. You don't hear none of this. You don't hear none of the nuances. You don't yeah. hear how, when you do get that bread, how they turn you to the villain. Y'all remember my first three years? I was on high school, bubble gum. Yeah, 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 yeah. Soon as I signed, now I'm the villain. I'm out here fouling niggas, yeah. flagrant. <laughs> I, I'm leading the league in fucking text. You know the, what I'm saying? You're the, high, the high, no, biggest bro, contract in sports. It's the narrative. Yeah. Bro, I really believe that the league has a system in which they put out on villains, in which they can go get the they can go get the tech from two. At the time I was in, in, in the league, uh, text was two, uh, $100. Uh, five years within that, text was five, five, uh, 500 Within two more years of that, a tech was $1,000. Today's tech is what? Five grand? Five, 25. Bro, imagine if I'm able to tech four or five niggas a night at 25. You hear what I'm saying to you? Business. This is where the league gives money back. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah I'm, I'm digging, and when y'all have me on the show, I'll come to y'all. Nah, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, <laughs> some other shit, bro. It's all, it's all, it's all narratives, and then they, they leverage that narrative. Yeah, and you 20, you 19 when you start, by the time you get that next contract, you 25, 24? Mm -hmm. 25 years old. And then guess what? I'm negotiating that at 23. Right. And then I start putting nuances in my contract, like, you know what? Instead of uh, instead of you trying to give me the 155, I'm gonna take the I'm gonna take 130. And you know what I want? I want a no trade clause, and then boom, I want time on the plane. Matter of fact, play for my share to go into this this G4 I'm finna buy, so I ain't gotta come out of pocket. Then I'm gonna put like it was and then, and then I get this insurance policy yeah, yeah, yeah. on me. You don't get the like <laughs> I had, this is all new business. Yeah. Mm. Me and Andy Miller, you know what I'm saying? Because Andy Miller was a new motherfucker and we was going through this creating this new traditional business that wasn't in that wasn't in contracts. And yeah. then Michael Jordan made it hard for motherfuckers to get money on the shoe contract because he was the only motherfucker that got 2% of a royalty. So no motherfucker was out selling Mike and shoes. So guess what every player got on the shoe? 2%. Mm. They don't care for who you were. And if he told you he got more than that, then you're lying. That's you lying, bro. It's a bunch of shit I ain't gonna lie here. But I'm just talking about yeah. the, the art of business yeah. and, and how you had to have an original mind and how you had to have an original thought. And you know, most motherfuckers are, are cringed by the thought of asking for it. Nah, not when I'm thinking I'm worth it. Not when I'm thinking I'm worth I'm working for it too. Yeah. No, I don't wanna hear that shit. I ground for this, you know what I'm saying? No, I don't want the 155. Matter of fact, defer my shit. Give it. You hear what I'm saying? Nobody was taught that. I had to get in here, get right, hit right, in the right. ribs, cut, cover up, throw back, get off. And now I was like, okay, cool. I got a front kick, get him up. Oh, I got a side kick now. Ain't, like, I start understanding the business. Yeah. I start going to the lockout meetings. I start sitting in this room. I start wanting to listen to David Stern. Man, David Stern would start the meeting with a stage where you was doing this to him. Mm. So I used to stand up on the meeting. <laughs> yeah, 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 KG. I used to come to meet me all black. <laughs> yeah, where, where the fine money go? Just yelling shit out, just, 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 just fucking with it. Uh -uh. Yeah, uh -uh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -uh. And then they start quit telling players where the meetings were. <laughs> and I start seeing my influence. I start seeing what my mic came on. I'm going, we're going, it's a dope. Nah, I love it, I love it, I love it. I'm saying all this to say that the way they was disrupting and the, they, and the way that they was they was looking at things to be a disruptor, not, not to say that I was trying to be a disruptor, I was trying to give us confidence to speak. Michael Jordan came in the room one day and they started talking about finance and I saw how all the players lit up. And I was like, man, I want that. I want, I want to be like that. Look how they react to him. But it was the only one in the, in the building that had the leverage to talk like this. And he seemed educated. Um, uh, do you guys take in your own personal curriculum or when, or, or y'all own, have you guys ever thought about actually coming out with your own way of doing? Um, we, it's crazy you say that. that's where it seems like it's going. We're, really. we're working on a curriculum right now. So we're working with, uh, the New York City School Department. So mm. it's crazy because New York City School Department is the largest school district in America. I think wow. it's like 900,000 yeah, stu um, students. Yeah. Um, like one point, so the number was 1.1 million, but Damn. after COVID, people started going private and charter right. schools. So. That's another question I got to ask you. Yeah. How much are y'all seeing yeah. homeschooling so, and all that? So 
this is the largest school district in America. It's the capital of capitalism, Wall Street and all of that. Wow. And there's no financial literacy in the school district at all. So it's like, how does that even make design, sense? Bro. How does yeah. that make sense? That's by design? Yeah. 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 I would say. That's the yeah. extra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I should have been invisible now. You, know, you can be invisible now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. So, I can see across the world now. So, yeah. yeah. Until you have the power of the phone. Facts. So, now you don't need this. So, that's one of the things that, you know, they've been receptive to, to implement that. So, we're actually working on a curriculum. I didn't realize how hard it is to build a curriculum. Like, you know, you got to make sure that it tests certain standards and that, you know, different things put in place. So, we're working with. Um, a person that actually builds curriculums. So God willing, that'll be done like next next month. And then once that's done, hopefully we can get it in New York, but then also Chicago, LA, all of these places. I think financial literacy should be a part of every curriculum in school. Like, you know what I mean? That's it's something that's vitally important. If you think about it, I always say like, you know, the vast majority of us are never gonna use biology unless it is important, Facts. but unless you're a doctor, you're not going to use it. Chemist, you're not, you're not going to use chemistry. All physics. this shit, bro. I thought they, they, they teach in Greek mythology. You <laughs> and no disrespect to any English teachers, but yeah. is that more important than learning real estate and learning taxes and learning, you know, How to write investing? A plan. Exactly, and right. creating an LLC. Facts. Like, these are things that are vital to survival. Because every, so 100% of the people will pay taxes. Mm. Whether you're a garbage man or a president, you got to pay taxes. Right? Everybody's gonna live somewhere, whether you rent somewhere or whether you buy a home. You're nice. gonna have to rent, you're gonna have to, and you think about it, buying a house is probably the most important part of your life as far as a business decision, the mm -hmm. biggest purchase that most people make, and there's no education on how to buy a home. It's not. Yep. Like we just wing it, go to the bank. You don't know if you're getting taken advantage of, you don't know if it's a right mortgage buy for you. Car. Yeah, buy the car. Buy the car. Buy the car. Buy the car. Down on the car. <laughs> not even knowing you your got, credit score. Like it's a bunch of, it's a bunch. Yeah. I, that's by design. Yeah. We have been leveraged for a long time. I'm not sitting up here. Crying and, and complaining about, it. I'm just talking about the, the times in which we are where we are. And I see a lack of script out here. I don't, you know, we're all from the same neighborhood or, or, or neighborhoods that are alike. It's no script. And if so, the script is not the script that none of us want to go down, right? Because we all got the homie that went down this script, right? Mm -hmm. How much of, um, how much of, matter of fact, I don't want to ask that. I want to ask, <clears throat> How far are we from you guys opening up your own facility, your own institution of where? Because I really feel like school system is outdated. I think we need a school system now that prepares me and you to leave school. And I need to be able to live on my own right now when I leave school. I need to be able to know how to write a business plan, mm -hmm. uh, interview. I need to be prepared. I need to have classes to prepare me for interviews. I need to be, uh, be prepared for the camera. Uh, I need to know uh, certain things, uh, uh, stigmas I need to stay away from, from when asked, like training, like real training. School is outdated. Yeah. School is not for creators. School is not for you to leave school and survive. How far that? Uh, how how much of what I'm what I'm spitting at you guys? Yeah. Actually, you guys believe it. Uh, we're not far. Um, in many ways, uh, I feel like education reform is what you're talking about. Facts. And so when we were doing the classroom with those kids, that's what we were doing, preparing them for the real world. Mm -hmm. I really like this is the real world. Yeah. Like this is the crossroads you like, but this is the real world. And so we created an online university ourselves. Right, so we have curriculum inside there. People listen to the episode, and we're talking about different career aspirations, but people needed a more in-depth conversation so they actually get to speak to people that are in the careers. It's different when you listen to a professor and it's just theoretical, right? Because if the professor was doing it, you wouldn't be your professor. Facts. Right? But whereas you hear somebody that's actually inside of the business that you aspire to do, and they're telling you exactly how to do it. And so we created the online because Again, when, I was, when you teach inside of one district, you belong to that district. Mm. But when you teach online, you belong to the world, right? And so economics is a global issue. Financial literacy is a global issue. And so that's why we were like, all right, well, let's figure out, rather than having a brick and mortar, which is important, which I see us doing at some point, but let's scale this thing globally. Let's show up in places that people don't go, right. where financial issues are a topic. So when we, we go to Nigeria, right, and we mm -hmm. go to Lagos, and people are listening, they're like, Nobody's telling us this stuff. We need y'all here. Okay, perfect. We go to London, same thing. We go to Kingston, Jamaica, same thing. We go to Davos, and they're looking like, what are those guys doing here? And to our community, it's like, what are they doing there? Until we tell them what the impact of going to these places looks like. And so we're, we're, we're not far from having a, a brick and mortar place where we are at Leisure University, but let's have the greatest impact on a global scale. Let's, the revolution is gonna be through technology. Yeah. And so through our phones, we can connect at any second of the day. Yeah. Information is rarely available. So we look at ourselves as the source for that.
That's unbelievable, man. Man, I did, I, online, that's, that's, that's actually the wave. Nothing's brick and mortar no more. How much of, uh, of, of, of homeschooling or would I say hybrid schooling's going on did y'all see happening today? Is it, is it changing? Um, no, I, change I think COVID definitely changed a lot, but I feel like now it's kind of back to, to normal as far as um, the vast majority of you know, people still learning in that type of environment, traditional learning environment. But I feel that one thing that COVID did was change the mindset of people where they know that they don't have to, mm. not only not learn in a physical brick and mortar, but they don't have to work in a physical brick and mortar Absolutely. either. That changed the, like, even if you look at commercial real estate, right? Yep. There's commercial real estate collapse in America where a lot of people are not returning back to the office. Nope. Cause you realize that what's the point in just going here all day, wasting time, going to a lunch break, or I could just be in my living room, yep. get the work done, we'll go to done. a meeting on Zoom. Right. And the day's over. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's so, more efficient. Would you say it's more efficient? Absolutely. It's extremely more efficient. Absolutely. Extremely. I feel like it's a lot. It's more efficient for the business owner as well. Because mm-hmm. now I don't have to pay for overhead. Mm-hmm. I don't have to pay for, you know, the chef to come and make lunch and do all of this variety of different things where it's like, get your work done, right? You get your work done. If you're, if you're getting your work done, you can be in Aruba. You can be in Mexico. Right. It Good doesn't job. matter. That's dope. At your leisure. That's yeah. <laughs> that's the hybrid business that I think that's going to be the yeah. future, right? That's, that's the, the new, that's the new that's business model. New I, I think COVID also made people realize that one source of income was too close to none. Mm. Right? And so when they were doing that, oh, let's say that nine to five, that was great. But they realized that I could lose my job tomorrow. And then what? And so when you hear like, hey, there's money, you can make money in investing in stocks. You can make money in real estate. You can make money in vending. You can make money in so many trucking. There's so many different businesses that you can do, mm. which don't have as much of a, a startup as maybe going to NYU, which is going to cost you 70000 right? right? I could start a business with 5000 And I could scale that in five years. By the time I graduate, I have a, you know, a six-figure business or a seven-figure business. You could keep that NYU education. So people started looking like, how can I make sure that I have multiple streams of income? Which is the goal. It's important too, man. Yeah. Everybody wants one stream. Everybody wants to be able to have an octopus of, of multiples. I get it. Tell me, tell me about you guys. Is of um, what's the name of you guys? This fest y'all do? Y'all, oh, y'all, Invest Fest. Oh, yes, yeah, Invest yeah, Fest. Yeah, yeah. Talk yeah. about Invest Fest a little bit. No, I appreciate it. So yeah, so <laughs> the idea, you know, music festivals have become real popular. Yes. From absolutely. Rolling Loud to Coachella, all of them. Who's picking all of that, right? So it's like, all right. Once again, that's kind of how Earn Your Leisure started, taking the best elements that we like and then putting our spin on in the business. Mm. So it's like, all right, when we was looking at this a few years ago, we we're like, all right, how do we take the best elements of a festival but make it educational? Mm. So the idea for Invest Fest came about, right? So in Invest Fest, we have musical performances, we have a vendor marketplace, but it's live panels, live podcasts, and keynote speakers. So based around crypto and Web3 and real estate and stocks. But we'll have a Rick Ross perform. Fact. We'll have a Jeezy perform, like, you know, because it's just it's part of the culture. Um, so it's it's a fun vibe. So it's not like boring. I think that that's how we really revolutionize education for the reason why I didn't like to go to school is because it was boring. Mm. I probably, I, I, I didn't, I always liked to learn. I was very interested in learning my whole life. I liked to read, I liked to watch the History Channel. Like, I always was into that type mm. of information. I just didn't like traditional schooling. Mm. So it was like, for me, I felt like I would have been an even better student if education was fun. Mm. If education was relatable, mm. if I was learning about your contract in 10th grade, I would have actually been interested in it instead of reading Macbeth. Mm. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's so like... You weren't stimulated. Yeah, exactly. Which most exactly. Kids are. So that's what... So it's like for Invest Fest, we just did an infusion of that. So like for this year, we got Diddy, we got Robert Smith, yeah. we got Rich Paul, um, we got Jeezy performing. So it's... Junior Bridgman. Junior Bridgman. Mm. So that's huge. So many different people that have been highlights in our culture, extremely successful, but you might not have ever heard their backstory. How, how important is having examples that look like us come from where we come from? How, how, how important are those, are those examples to Michael Jordan's, to Rob Smith's, to Oprah's? I, I, how important are, are, the, are, are our figures? It's extremely important because I feel like, especially the people that people don't know, like, you know what I mean? Or the side of a person that nobody knows. So I feel like, For a long time, the number one thing was to be a basketball player or a rapper. The reason being is because 
that seemed attainable. You see it, like, you know what I mean? Like, you see somebody that in your neighborhood that made it to the league. Realistic. You see somebody mm-hmm. in your neighborhood that got a record deal. So realistic. You can turn on ESPN and watch you play. It's mm-hmm. cool, so it's like, Fox. all right, Fox. these are people that I, I know I can actually have some level of similarity mm-hmm. to. So if they can make it, I can make it. But we never saw Robert Smith. We never saw Don Peebles. We never saw, you know, all of these other people that was just in business. So now it's to be like, all right, let's highlight these people because the vast majority of people is not going to have a career as a superstar athlete or a superstar musician, right? But you might be able to do real estate. You might be able to do private equity. Mm-hmm. But let's also show the basketball star, the musician, the other side of it. So it's like, all right, we know Rick Ross, but we don't know his real estate portfolio. Mm-hmm. We might not know all of the businesses. Like, how did he actually start investing in Wingstop, right? Mm-hmm. So now that even gives a different motivation as well, where it's like, all right, I want to be Rick Ross, but I can't rap. But I can still use him for motivation on the business side. Right. Like, I want to be a restaurant owner. I want to open up wing stops. I want to mm-hmm. do this. I want to buy, you know, real estate, different things of that nature. So for us, I think that providing that visibility and the examples is probably the most important thing that we can do because now that that puts real tangible hope into it. And just the everyday people as well. Yep. So it's like the everyday mortgage broker, the everyday, the everyday um, accountant, right, who's just doing good things in the neighborhood. Um, it's like, damn, like, if he could do it, I could do that too. Yeah. Like, cause I never forget, it, it was a crazy story to about the kids. So we was um, in the community center one day, and these kids, they are probably like 16 years old. So it was two kids. And one kid, he was saying, we asked him, like, what he wanted to be when he grew up. And he said he wanted to be an architect. And um, his friend, and it's just so crazy, his friend was right next to him. His friend started laughing. And I'm sure he didn't even do it maliciously, but he started laughing, right? 30 seconds later, the kid looked at his friend, internalized it, and then he came back to us. He was like, I probably do sanitation. Because he, in his mind, he just thought like, it just lowered his self-esteem so much that his friend just laughed at him, told him he's going to be an architect, where he was like, that's not realistic. But I know why he said he's going to be a sanitation worker because there's a lot of people in the neighborhood that's sanitation. So it's like, all right, that's more, that's more attainable. There's no disrespect to sanitation, but it's like, oh, that's a damn, damn, if, 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 right if he would have knew... Trash architect- man's a good thing, man. He got a dead in it, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but if he would have knew architects, yeah. he wouldn't have laughed, yeah. right? right? So it's like, we got to show... Him and his friend, like, nah, that's not nothing to laugh at. If he wants to do it, that's something that he can actually do. It's, it's the J line. He's like, everybody want to be us. We just gotta see us. Facts. So imagine if you saw us in all these lanes. Like when, when I remember when Jeezy was doing the verses and he was like, I own half of Atlanta, and then people were like, well, we can't find anything on his name in Atlanta because he's putting it in his business name, <laughs> right? There's a lesson. There's a lesson there. But we, we're, we're like villainized, like, oh, he's lying. No, there's actually a business lesson there, yeah. right? When we talk about these deals, like. Puff with the spirits industry. Even our entertainers, the people that we looked at as billionaires, especially in music, they didn't do it for music. No. Nope. Yeah, he didn't do it for music. No. Nope. He did it from business. Jay didn't do it for music. Yeah, of course it helped him. It gave him the notoriety, gave him the trust and a brand, but he did it inside, inside of spirits industry. So, like, there's business lessons to be taught, but nobody's telling them. Right. Nobody's telling them. So, when we go back, when I was talking about that ladder, it was like, okay, if we have the knowledge and we understand how that business structure works, now it's our job to explain it to the people because once they see it, it's more obtainable, right? I was watching <laughs> Real Sports on HBO. You can edit that out, but... <laughs> nah, <laughs> no, nah, it's true. We're, we're real they, they were, they were uh, talking about AI and tech and they were talking about athletes. And the dude was like, look, there's a 100% chance that the kids who are here today are going to have a job in this profession. There's a 1% chance that the kid in the neighborhood who's shooting a basketball is going to make it to the NBA. Mm. We should have more kids at this convention. Yeah. And that's the truth. Because if they study that and it becomes their skill, right. that's something that can never be taken away. Right. But we got to see that. So we got to highlight, like he said, the CPA. We got to highlight the mortgage broker. Facts. We got to highlight the, the logistics companies. We got to highlight all these people that title are doing things. Right. Right, title all companies. Shit, yeah. right. Accountants. All yeah, your, your entertainment lawyer. Like All right. these people need to be highlighted because the chances are you can have their career. Like It's obtainable. Like You can do it and you can live a great life doing it. Man, that's the script, bro. Like, it ain't, like, the traditional script is out the door, I think. I think we're in the midst of hybrid and waves and how things are getting done. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about, um, in, in, in your estimation, why don't we see, uh, 
you know, black, um, black capital firms. How come we don't see our own black banks that stand out for us and talk to us about our education and talk to us about our community and coming in this community to develop? How come we don't, how come I never see no highlights of none of that you shit? You know, it's crazy you say that because See, none of this. So, I'm going to come back to that word highlight. So when we, 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 <laughs> right. we, we, we was with um, Robert Smith, we interviewed Robert Smith at Carnegie Hall. And for anybody that doesn't know who Robert Smith is, he's the richest black person in American history, actually. How we don't know that? Everybody probably think it's Oprah or Jordan. Yeah. You know why? That's script, bro. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 man, they don't want you dreaming of that. Yeah. They, they yeah. Don't, they, that's not the dream yeah. they, they throwing at us. You saw Oprah that's every day on your TV. That's you saw fact. Jordan every other day on your Facts, TV. Right. And you saw Robert him every day. Smith. Robert Smith came out and tried to give everybody, try to pay for everybody's shit. Then next thing you know, he's finna go to jail. <laughs> I never heard from Robert Smith ever again. Yeah. You will this August. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my biggest beef with yeah. a lot of our black uh, billionaires is that not only, I think Damon Jones come back here and I see him like coming back and tapping in a little bit, but man, our black billionaires don't come out and give script. They don't throw no lobs. They don't, they don't, you know what I'm saying? It's almost. And I think that that's so. I battle you know, with that too. So, it, it, we, but you know what? Because I interviewed when we interviewed um, Steve Stout, mm. and we were saying like, "Yo, Jay got to get a blueprint. Da da da. They got to get a blueprint. They got a blueprint." And he was like, "I'm gonna be honest with you, it's not gonna happen." He's like, "But that's not their job. That's your job." He was like, "Your job is to put the ladder from the clouds to the ground," and he was like, "You relay the information, and you're the connector." And when he said that, I actually started to think about it a little differently. And I'm looking at a lot of, especially... Oh, man. Nah, no, 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 there's, there's more to it. But no, so, yeah. so I'm looking at, like, even like a lot of these billionaires, right? It's like their brain is, they don't have the same level of connectivity that we have with the community. Mm -hmm. They're in a whole different world. They probably want to give back and provide information, but they just don't know how to go about it. So now it's like we've been able to provide that bridge from them to the people, right? Because it's like Jay, Jay, I heard Jay told Nipsey this story before he passed away. They said that he told Nip, he was like, you're in places I can no longer go to. I'm in places that you can't get to. We need each other. That's bar. That's a bar. Like, you know what I'm saying? That's so it's like, yo, you I, on no, the ground. It's not facts. What? That, it's not facts. <laughs> But here, you, don't other, think, you don't think that's facts? I don't think that's here's facts. Other, so why, think why, that, why not? Why not? You know what? Jay is in a room of people that he's had to make com make comfortable and make them respect him to be in that room, right? If you understand Nipsey and where he comes from, he comes with the same respect that Jay is. He's just a younger version of Jay. Mm -hmm. Jay can't go where Nipsey can go, but Nipsey can go where Jay can go. And then in real talk, Jay can go where Nipsey can go. Jay don't want to go where Nipsey has. But it's going. It's going. Like, if Jay, look at if Jay go back to yeah, the neighborhood, can. it's going. To Absolutely, cause, he it's, can. It's going to cause a frenzy. Jay can't go into a room where Nipsey goes. You say physically, or That's, I'm I'm saying physically. Jay it's, can't go into Compton and talk to some real niggas in Compton. It's going. He can't go into the West Side of Chicago talk to some real ones in Chicago. But he's so Jay can't go to Detroit talk to some real. What up though? Like, but you don't feel like he's. It's like Obama. You think uh, Obama can? Yeah, really? yeah. I'm Obama, <laughs> nigga. The fuck you mean? Yeah. <laughs> The fuck you mean? Right, I'm the ticket. I'm good everywhere. But other, you different, but though, because you, you, you're ah, different. They, come on, bro. Here's the other part. Here's the other part, right? <laughs> I'm talking about motherfuckers that walk in the room and think that they can, that think that, yeah, y'all excited to see me, that these people that hold Honora. Yeah, they, 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 like, yeah, true, 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 true men. That I, you know, like, man, like, stand up guys, bro. Like, I believe Jay-Z can walk in any room, boardroom or hood, and be good. If not, like, what? what's the fear? But you don't think that he would be out of place? Fuck, no. Nah. He, he, he's frosty. He's but, it, but it's 30 years nah, later, though, bro. fuck that, bro. Cho the hood don't change. These streets are the same. The people in them change. These streets gonna be the same, man. Brownsville's gonna be here when we dead and gone. Fucking Brooklyn gonna be here when we dead and gone. True. Straight up. Straight but, up. So is it more important for him to go to these individual places? Or affect something on a global scale. Man, listen, if I was Hove, I'd throw a million man march and he initiated. You remember the motherfucking video when he had all the dope? Man, that was one of the hardest videos ever. Which one? Which one? And I was sitting up here, man, when he had Khaled, he had. Oh, with the suits on. With the suits on. With the suits on. Man, bro, that was an entendre over everybody's hair, bro. Yeah. Bro, imagine having like a seven million man march with all niggas in there. You know how the niggas dressing up now and all looking all Devin ass yeah. shit? Imagine, imagine you got one of those, bro. But how about this? That's uh, influence. Now uh, what you saying in there? That's a room full of motherfuckers that want to build. Yeah. It's a room full of minds, room full of ideas. So he can a, initiate that. That's a, what I'm saying. Here's the other part. Here's the other piece of it. And I, it took me maybe till this year to realize it, because I felt some of those same ways as you. Mm. 
These are all first-generation billionaires. Mm. There's what, no blueprint for There's them. no blueprint for Great them. point. You see what I'm saying? Like, no we don't have the same type of grace. No doubt. Right? It's like, y'all figured it out. Come back and tell us. No doubt. We haven't seen the generational right. wealth yet because they did it. We saw Oprah do it. We watched that happen. We watched right. Jay do it. We watched Tyler Perry do it. We watched Puff do it. They're all first generation. We don't even know what generational wealth looks like in our community. Robert Smith, Dave Stewart, we don't know what it looks like yet. This isn't the Walmart family. No. Nope. This isn't the Hilton family, right? This isn't the Carnegie family. Those pe- that is, this isn't the Rockefeller family. Those are generations of it. They've had time to make mistakes, figure this thing out. Make mistakes, figure this thing out. Oh, this works. We're watching our billionaires do it in real time and saying, why aren't y'all doing this? Well, they got to figure it out, <laughs> right? The same way it took them to get to the space where nobody has been to, Rihanna, Ye, making mistakes, they got to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Let's see what they do, right? Let's see what sustainable wealth looks like. Because again, they're doing it right now and they're creating it, right? They're creating the foundation, they're cementing their name. What does that name look like in 100 years? Right. Because we always think, hey, let's do it today. What happens, like, we want our names to live on forever. Uh-huh. That's impact. I, I said this the other day. There's a difference between somebody who wants to be known and somebody who wants to be remembered. You want to be known? That's fine. Go on Instagram. You want to be remembered? Build something. Chris, build something that has impact that lives on for a legacy. Facts. You took that right out of my mouth. I was going to actually say that. <clears throat> Man, um... Man, my, my mind is going 100 miles an hour. Apologies. Um, I'm up here sitting up there thinking as you was talking, like, but those people got to come back and, and give us something versus nothing. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Oprah went from whatever she is, and this is my opinion, you know what I'm saying? And then we never seen Oprah again. You know, I feel Have like, we? I, I haven't. Well, here's why. Oprah's impact becomes Tyler Perry's impact. Mm. She influenced him. He employs his... He has Oprah a, disappeared, though. But she, her impact is on top. Oprah disappeared. No, she didn't disappear. Yeah, so Oprah disappeared. No, she, did. she still has a TV network. She hasn't disappeared. Where? She doesn't have a show. Yeah, she still has a TV network. But here's the thing: her impact. Tell me where to find Oprah right now. Go. She's on. <laughs> Go. I'm she's in production. Done. We're TV. We got. He teed up. <laughs> Mike, you see this guy right here? He's going to. As soon as you say whatever. Yeah. Oh. Oh. No, no, wait. Oh. Homie ain't here. <laughs> oh, don't exist. Oh, drop, still exists. Drop the addy. But what I'm saying is like her impact. She influences Tyler Perry, right, to create a production studio where Tyler Perry now has a hundred and fifty million dollar payroll. Ninety five percent of it goes to black people. Ninety five percent. Think about that. Yeah. But, but Who I, else is doing that? Yeah. That's so like that. that's part of her. Impact, yeah. that lives on forever. Outside of Owen and, and Oprah Winfrey, the brand, Harpo, the production company, who knows who she's in? Like, the Tyler Perry is a direct one. It's just like us. Like, we might be impacting somebody right now. We don't know yet. Mm-hmm. But then also, I think that in business, one of the best ways to start a business is to figure out what is the need and what is not currently being serviced and start a business for that. So I feel like there's a, what you're saying, right, there's always been a problem of the black elite not providing the information oh, to... Or initiating. Jay-Z can go initiate a, 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 a raise right now. So, but so that... So, so that's this, what I'm saying. So this, so, so this is when we come into play, right? Mm. So now we actually started a platform where now we can talk to Tyler Perry, we can talk to Steve Harvey, we can talk to whoever, right, Robert Smith. They can provide information, which is kind of like mentorship in a way because now people can actually watch them for the first time and get detailed information. Gotcha. We can throw the events. We can bring them there. So it's like we can wait for them to do it, but we saw that, all right, there's actually an opportunity here. And maybe they, they want to do it. They just don't know how to go about it. Yeah. So it's like they got a lot going on. So right. instead of us trying to knock them, let's create our own ecosystem, our own entity, where now we provide the information and now we can be the bridge yeah. from the clouds all the way down to the ground. And it's, it's the education part, right? You said, why don't we have private equity? Why don't we have venture capital? How many people even know what that means? Right? You're not being taught that. You don't even have people to look up to to say, oh, that's what I want to be. But like, if Jay's doing that, like, Marcy Ventures exists. But let's talk about how that came about. How'd you fund it? Mm-hmm. Who's running it? What are some of the initiatives that it's doing right now? So, because it's there, there's just no education behind it. Most of the people don't even know it exists. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, we have to educate our people more about these terms, right? Like, you remember in school when you had to write up definitions? Mm. Right? Nobody's read your That's not even, right. we're not looking that up. We're looking up glossary words, and it's like, can you spell this correctly? That's why reform is important. Like, right. do we need, like, he's, I don't need to know how to spell. We got spell check. 
You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let's work on some things that we really need to know. So these are the things, like creating fundamental reform around education where we're teaching people about tangible things that they'll need for their future. But I want to talk about that bank thing because that is important. So Don Peebles, Don Peebles is, an, is another black billionaire. He's a real estate developer. He's the first one to tell us that 98.5% of venture capital money, which is like $11 trillion a year, goes to white male businesses. So 1.5% of that trillions of dollars from venture capital goes to minority and women businesses combined. Women businesses being white businesses, mm -hmm. some minorities being black, Mexican, white. Asian. White women are Every minority. single person outside of white men wow. is fighting for 1.5% of the money that's in circulation from private equity and venture capital. Robert Smith told us that <clears throat> this was something that was extremely insightful. That 98.5% of venture capital firms are run by white men. So what does this tell us, right? White men are lending to white men. Now, this is when you start to think about it from a bigger scale. How we solve the, the problem in this country with finances is not really, you know, going to Washington and politicians. We need black-owned venture capital firms. We need black-owned private equity firms. We need black-owned banks because it's been proven that people genuinely lend to each other. So, like, black-owned firms, they lend to black companies. It's just not enough of them. It's not initiated. Who initiates that? So this goes back to now, right? Speaking of sports, mm -hmm. a lot of guys are into private equity and venture capital now, right, and tech. But there's enough guys with $100 million, $300 mm -hmm. They're getting $400 million contracts pretty soon. Thanks. So now, at some point, we need our superheroes in athletics and sports to come together mm. and start a bank mm. and start a venture capital firm, right? Mm. You bring somebody in that has expertise, but I feel like we have enough resources in just those two areas, sports and entertaining, mm -hmm. to really start making yeah. tremendous differences. Not just tremendous differences in your own investments, that's important, but really building real companies mm. that can actually go out and lend to the next startup company, to the next tech founder that's in Morehouse College right now mm -hmm. that's just trying to get his company off the ground, yeah. right? So that's something that I think is a conversation. And like I said, it, sports is something that these numbers are only going to keep going up. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that might be something in the next 10 years, hopefully, where maybe even you, you could spearhead it. Yeah. Initiate. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things, like especially in the NBA, I feel like it's there. Right, like we, we sat down with Roger Mason. Shout out to Roger Mason. Mm -hmm. He's in Davos with us. He's trying, like he's a former NBA player. No Andre Iguodala is another guy where they're having mm -hmm. tech summits at the All Star games. Yeah. And it's like, how many guys are receptive to that? Okay. How many? How many guys are showing up to that? But they gotta have their own. They gotta have their own entity. That's what I'm, yeah, that's what I'm this saying. This guy, but, Chris Paul, it gotta Chris be Paul, right. Bron, all, all these. They, they gotta they, come they, together. They have the mindset to do it, and they have the capital to do it. It's so when you initiate it, and then two having a plan of who and where you're going. A lot of guys <clears throat> don't jump on board with a, a lot of other guys or you don't see the continuity of guys working together or when you do see a group of guys working together, it's kind of like their clique. You'll see LeBron, you'll see Chris Paul, you'll see D-Wade. Melo. You'll see Melo. That, that's kind of their little, you know, so you don't really see. And then I just think that with the, young, with the younger generation, they just don't have an interest in it. That, the younger generation is about like you. They're, if it, ain't, if it ain't something that we're stimulating them, yeah. I don't want to hear that shit from the weight on my 250, get my yeah. 250, uh -huh. they Because they're building their own personal brands. They are. So where does it take to change that, though? Interaction. Mm. Stimulation. What would change you to get you to learn? You sitting in class like this. You still getting it, but if it wasn't something that was that, you was probably falling asleep or falling off, right? But if I was a teacher and I clapped at you and got you to, whoa. I used to have this teacher and she talked with her hands. And she used to be like, on 1776, <laughs> the harbor of Boston, England. The harbor was calling, and the fog came up. And you guess what you was doing? You were looking at Miss, you looking at Miss Willoughby like, what? what, 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 what he had a fog? He was on the horse, Paul Revere, what's that? Right, and he was yeah. shouting, he was. The stimulation of teaching and yeah. initiation. I know that when I have a conversation with a bunch of little, uh, young guys, I first off start with two. By the time I'm in like a midst of a full conversation, and look up, they about like eight little things right here. Mm. And they just chopping. 
And they ask him questions, and then, and then, that's the stimulation I'm talking about. When a mom come to Jay and he looking for certain whatever, because I'm sure Nipsey was looking for something that was over his head, right? Mm -hmm. And that's their interaction. Bro, you from the hood. He was probably seeing a parody of himself, right? So you got to think that we're all in the lines of wanting more. That's about the accessibility. And then you factual what you're saying. You're giving me a life experience and you're sharing it with me. Those initiations is what we're looking for. Those are the scripts that these young boys going to follow. And I sit down and I ever get a chance to talk to Job. I'm going to talk to Job about my experiences. And he's going to be able to pour something from that. Yeah. On how I was able to, man, you know, everyone coming from the hood. Everybody coming from something uh, and then going to something greater, right? Yeah. You got to make changes. You got to start adjusting some parts of your life. Those parts of which you're leaving are comfortable. You got to go into some new stuff that you ain't never been into. You ain't got no script for that, yeah. right? Until yeah. a big bro comes yeah. and tells you, yo, when I was in the league, I did it like... So that's what I'm saying when I say those those figures to come back and give the script. You know, if I was Obama, it, man, everybody going to show up and listen to how, how receptive inside of that fraternity of the league were the players, right? Because I remember you... You had the Nike deal, you had the N1 deal, then you had the Adna deal out in China, which is revolutionary. Adidas, Adidas, Adidas right? Mm -hmm. And so I remember you talking about ownership. Mm -hmm. Before everybody was talking about ownership, you were talking about ownership. How receptive to other guys as you're doing it, right? Because there's one thing to be an OG, but in order to teach somebody, they got to be accessible to learning. Facts. Right? And like, if I'm trying to build my own brand, I'm like, hey, OG, okay, I hear you, but I'm trying to do my own thing. How receptive were was that fraternity inside the NBA when you were doing it? It was receptive, and it was the how you going about it. In the five-man game, when we pass the ball to each other, bro, this ain't the time to be trying to get your brand off, nigga. What the fuck? You got to say that. You got to say that, because guess what? You didn't know. I'm out here trying to... I'm getting it off. Uh, uh, they feeling me. I'm out here. Bro, you out here, but we all got the same. You know what I'm saying? So when you give that know-how, when you give that script to the young guy, and then you're like, yo, bro. And then, guess what? When you're coming into the game, that's the chance to get your individual. When they got you coming in, you got you what you're dressing in. What? That's mm -hmm. your chance. Mm -hmm. Y'all here playing five on five and we all need each other? Nah, that ain't it. Or giving a script similar to that mm -hmm. and showing the know-how. That was the difference, you know what I'm saying? Just like anything else. Our parents show us something that's totally different from, us saying, from them saying it to us. Mm -hmm. you know? So I really believe that. Um, and I believe that that script is important for the young guy because the young guys never get access to us because you know what? When they see me, I'm in the seat watching them play. <laughs> when they get up and they leave and they walking out in their street clothes, I'm probably on my way home and, and it's never this. Unless I stay and we, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm trying to find ways of being able to uh, uh, create a big brothers, big sisters program for the NBA and the WNBA where uh, guys uh, uh, and women can actually come to some of their their influences and get script, you know? Like, 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 you gotta think of the, 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 the greats that went through everything. And then this is another thing I wanted to say too. I don't wanna, I wanna kill this moment. But I wanna say that sometimes you build something up and you never get to re, really reap the benefits of what you build. I see that in the league every day. Mm -hmm. I went to every, ever since 1995, I went to every lockout meeting. I was at every lockout uh, meeting that we had as players and I spoke up on my behalf of my players in the fraternity and stood up for all the rules, only to know that out of those same fights, I would be cut out or you would be carved out and you would be shifted into a whole nother bracket. Now, we don't want you around no young guys because of your influence, what you know, and all that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So mm. the big brother goes so far when it comes to the league. They want you to be able to give the script. Now, let that same mind come into a room where it's influence and it's rules and uh, they're talking about uh, salary changes and, 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 and how they're going to do streaming and all this now. Mm. You know, now uh, uh, the, the, you can do weed business now. You can do some yeah. of this linear stuff now. NIL's cracking, yeah. right? It's cool for when it, when it, when it, when it goes with their agenda. But when that same mind comes back around and challenges that agenda, it's a whole nother. Whoa! It's, well, it's, is that the end? Is that the NBA? Is that the players' association's job to? Because the NBA is in their best interest for the owners, right? But the players' association that. They're supposed to be representing the players, right? They're supposed to. But they have to work with the NBA, who's the bigger leverager here. You understand what I'm saying to you? And the business is, that's the business. Uh, the, the Players Association protects the players at all costs. But the league is controlling everything. We change the rules, just the rules. Y'all don't like it, da, 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 and, and it's a battle. And the league, I think, since Adam Silver has taken over, has gotten a little more resilient with working with. You know, before then, prior traditional uh, owners and, and prior traditional uh, a commissioner was more different. He was a more traditional thinker. 
know what I'm saying? It was more like, do as you're told. And this is what it is. And he had a vision on how he was on building and taking us into other countries. And then turned around and said, hey, look, we're in 250 countries. We're in 400 different countries. And had a whole plan. You looked up and nobody recognizes the game now. We got Euros. If you don't have the Euro in your game. <laughs> I mean, I, I show up to a real part. Show up to West Fourth. I show up to Fifty Fifth, and I got a Euro. <laughs> you're Are you killing me? But it worked. But nah. for, for him standpoint, if you look at the look at the, the past four years, I'm saying who, you're trying to you taking it out of culture and you're yeah. developing it to something else. Is my point. Okay, I got you. Got you. You know got what I'm you. saying? The, the game ain't the game ain't uh, it ain't it ain't in America no more. No, no, no it's no. a universal it's, game now. For that's sure. true. So that so that for sure. so now we can implement uh, outsiders to come in and play. And but, I don't mean to say. Uh, overseas players or Europeans or outsiders, but the game was built from an American standpoint. Now that's blown out. Now yeah. we're universal. It's we're universal game. everywhere. So guess yeah. what you're you're getting? You're getting the you're getting the, the Asians coming up with slick moves and they got their little stuff. You got you got uh, Italians putting their move on it as you want. Yeah. So you're growing the game, right? But the core, the foundation is weakening and the roots are weakening. But you're starting new branches everywhere. It's almost like a if you understand um if you understand uh, uh, um, grow ops, mm -hmm. and you grow the genetic out, and you grow a mother out, and you're clipping, clipping, you, the mother is still here. And that's my point. And when you grow the game, you've grown the game so much now that it's not even recognized as mm -hmm. what it once was. Who's, who's fault do you think that is, I'm though? not saying it's fault. And I'm no, saying I'm that the game you. has to grow like that. I'm saying now that we have to accept now that uh, it's universal and it ain't so much your best players are here in your own country. Mm. And that's what you want from a business, right? Yeah, scaling. Okay, so, uh, but you lose coaching and all of that. But there has been a decline in basketball, because I, I went to McDonald's All-American game this year, and I don't know, I might just be biased because I'm, you know, I'm older, but I remember going to high school games and watching Tim Thomas play and watching Shaheem Holloway play. They just seem much superior in their skill set than the kids now. No disrespect to the kids now, but I feel like there's a drop-off in, in American talent? In distraction. It's a drop off in distraction. It's a drop off in script. It's a drop off in imagination. I'm dreaming on what I'm looking at every day. I'm dreaming about this and what I'm seeing you doing on this and I'm, I'm following that. I don't have no originality or what the fuck. Like the kid who said the architect, I wanted to be the architect and that was in his mind. And he's so influenced off the laugh, like, oh, you know what, fuck that. You know, I'm like, uh, <laughs> that's, it. I, that, 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 that's where we live yeah. And I'm saying that to say that to roll into NIL. NIL, I love the idea, but when it scares me, it kills the hunger. Bro, if I was in high school getting five million dollars, you <laughs> can't tell me nothing. Lord, can't I mean, you can me still nothing. tell me because my mom had a crazy right hand, right? Nah, I don't think they're going to tell you nah, that. You, <laughs> you ain't met Shirley. Like, oh, Shirley. Oh, we got a problem? We got a problem? Like, Shirley, show up and you show out. So I was definitely listening. You know, I wasn't yeah. that. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't no knucklehead, but. So you think. Because it's that, interesting. Because oh, oh, you changed, right? So, like, we, we could talk about the, the game expanding, but here in America, like, you're part of the change. I am. Right? Like, for better or for worse. High school? No doubt. No. Kids jumping, right? Because before it, you, it was Moses Malone. It was Malone. Moses Malone, right? It was Bill Willoughby, to respect the line. Yeah, the it first. Sean Kemp. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh. It was, um, first off, shout out to, um, oh, wow, we're going to go right into this. Um, I'm glad I'm teed up. <clears throat> um, I'm going blank on uh, Spencer. Spencer Haywood. Spencer Haywood. Spencer Haywood in 1968. Shout out to Spencer Haywood yes, for, yes, yes. for, for, for and, laying the, laying the pay, pathway for all of us to be able to have the ability to go from uh, high school uh, to professionals if you have the ability to make a team. Right. Bill, uh, uh, Spencer Haywood took us through that. Then Moses Malone um, mastered it. Everybody else comes down the line. Bill Willoughby and Sean Kent was the last before I tried it, and then after 25 years. But it was really, to me, a bunch of education that people didn't know. I don't know if y'all follow basketball, y'all do. So before 1995, when I came out, I was a kid by the name of Felipe Lopez from fucking Come on, Dominican Republic. Come on, that, of course. From, from New York, from Rice, New York. Rice High School. So let me say something to y'all. So Rice High me, School. This is me. I ain't, this I ain't is, that this, y'all. This, this is me. This is, this is Jordan. Felipe <laughs> Lopez was one of the greatest high school players Easily. I've ever seen in my life. And I played with Ronnie Fields. I seen Shea Cotton play. I seen some dope ass Shea high school Kyle. niggas, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord. The stuff that Felipe Lopez was doing, I, I didn't see a 6'6 guard doing. I'm just, and then the handles, and he was, Felipe Lopez did not, and was not aware of the rules that went along coming out of high school, going into the pros. Matter of fact, if you ask any of the players from 1994 all the way back to Harvard, none of them knew that. None of them knew, because the information, one, wasn't 
publicized. It wasn't where you can go find it. It wasn't where you can just pull it up in Michael Fish or is in a newspaper art. You didn't know that. Yeah. You had to have somebody in the league tell you that. So that's why I told you when I yeah. met Isaiah Thomas. I was going to say, it was Zeke, right? For you. He gave me a bunch of just knowledge. <laughs> yeah. That's why I say that the older head is important to the younger head because it helps the imagination. Yeah. Having conversations with multiple conversations with Isaiah Thomas has helped me not only shape when I go into these conversations in these rooms, but help shape the way I want to do my contract. So what's things to, uh, you know, would you take 134 or would you take 154? You would say, I'll take the 154. Well, what if you got to control your movement and you had a no trade clause in there and you was able to get uh, another 100 million from that no trade? Uh, you would look at the 154 and the 134 totally different now. And that conversations out of stuff like that, it helps. Yeah. So that's why I'm I'm an adamant like student of man, you gotta have old and young come in the room together. Nipsey got better after he talked to Jay. He got smart. He took it back to his to his crew and was like, look, this is what I just learned from Jay. You gotta do that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um I say this to say that that information and the gap in that information exchanging is a huge gap. And that gap has to be shortened however we got to do it, whether it's through great uh, facilitators like yourselves, whether it's through our uh, socials or however, but we have to initiate. And then once we initiate in that room, the information going to flow. Now it's about execution and yeah. operators now on how to get all this done. I mean, the Zeke thing is interesting. Yeah, because he, he's a real teacher. And he, he's from it. He taught you, and yeah. what did the league do to him? The league still activates him. I, and, and I don't think I'm, the league did anything to him. No, no, I say this to say well, this. Well, they didn't push it. That's they, what I'm saying. They didn't. Mo they, it wasn't motivated. I hear what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? Even, it, but it didn't doubt to me. He's still but, on NBA TV, still out here. He's right. active. He, he has was, a whole he, nother, he was a coach. He's but, working with, uh, he's working with uh, Phoenix now. You know, he's uh, but, a special right, something. So I say all Phoenix. that. When he was a coach, he was a coach, right? He also was running the CBA. Absolutely. And a lot of rules that the NBA implemented <laughs> came from the CBA and his thinking. And what did they do to the CBA? He stepped on it. And created the the G League. That was his league. That was his league. He had his own league. Yes. Right now, if I'm giving you all this game and I have my own league, you ain't giving nothing. They take it. <laughs> let's let's be honest. Right. No, I'm saying I'm giving right. you the game. No, no, no. Right. No, no. And yeah, they know yeah, I'm yeah, giving yeah, you yeah, the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And if I if you give enough people the game, you might be a competitor to me. No. So what am I gonna do? No, I understand. In this business, with I'm the league, I'm gonna squash times. you. Absolutely. Well, so that's one of the things to the N A the N I L deal is interesting that you said that because I watched the interview with uh, Lenny Cook. Ooh, uh, remember Lenny Cook? Yeah, I know Lenny Cook. Where'd you watch this interview? It was a uh, Cameron show. Well, uh, it, it is what it is. It is what it is. Shout out to Cameron. Shout out to Cameron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, that, yeah that, that's, that show's hilarious. Word. That show is actually hilarious, by the way. <laughs> right. Lenny so, Cook was on there. Yeah, he was on there in the most recent episode. So, so one of the things okay. I want to do, I, I'm, 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 I want to start, I am starting a, uh, yeah, yeah, um, sorry, I am starting on my own, an academy in which we are promoting NIL. I want to get y'all views on how you guys see NIL and both pros and cons to it. Yeah, I think so. Like, watching Lenny, because it was interesting for me to watch Lenny Cook now, because I watched him as a kid. I was at Nike camp. Like, I was, I was watching him as a fan of his a couple of years younger than him, but he was the superstar. Him, Tabashian Telfair, A Butter. Like, these are street legends at 16 years old in New York City, mm -hmm. 17 years old, going to the Rucker, like, they were street legends right. in high school. So seeing him, I saw him living the lifestyle of a rapper at 17 years old, hanging out with Fabulous, going to the clubs, buying bottles, and we was looking at that like that's something that's inspirational, but we didn't know, like, he was actually burning himself out because he had access at a young age, because he had... So I think without guidance, you give millions of dollars to a young kid, it's going to lead to issues. So that's even one of the things that we want to start to do. Because I remember that was my first thing I wanted to do was work with athletes, right? And even to this day, we still keep a lot of great relationships with athletes. People hit us up all the time. So it's like, I don't think we necessarily want to be agents per se, but if we could have like some level of like a consultant where we can, you know, match this person up with, this is the right real estate mm -hmm. person. This is the right stock person. Like just... Be careful when you do this. Like, give them some kind of guidance without trying to, like, be their parents. Um, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity in that space because this, there's going to be even more money mm -hmm. in this situation. Like, this is just the beginning. Yeah. So it's like, what happens when a high school kid gets a $20 million deal from Nike? Is he still hungry? 
Does he still work hard? Does he still reach that potential? Yeah. So y'all what, what, what y'all, potential y'all, though? Athletically though, right? Y'all are playing facilitator. Either yeah. way. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If we if they have that money, right, and they have a business acumen, then they don't, professional athletics might not even be the route. But what if we they have the opportunity to have that income now and create a business now? Mm-hmm. That changes everything, everything. right? Because your, your career as an athlete is definitely going to be between two timelines, your start and your end. Yeah. Now, depending on the sport, it could be three years, it could be five years, an injury could happen, it could be one year. But you always have the education mm-hmm. of how to create your business, right? You can, Like you said, you can do that from home. And so if they have the capital now, you take advantage of that. Right, we have to teach them how to take, take advantage of it. And the dream changes. Yeah, and it, it, it exactly. If they don't have the hunger for athletics, that's fine, but they might have it in something else. Right. And that might have been their vision all along. Right? It's just that they had a God given talent to say, yeah. all right, I can better myself. And so if they get to college, because what's the chances of how many Division I schools are there? Tons. 300 tons. tons. Right? Tons. 300 something. Only 50, 60, 54 players getting drafted in the NBA. Yeah. 54. Yeah. And <laughs> so you do the math. You say you about to do something with um, the kids? What I am, uh, I am pro- um, trying to do, or what I'm attempting to do, is uh, create an, uh, an outlet where kids can, um, like an academy. Like, you know, I mean, IMG, y'all, y'all familiar with IMG? I went, I went to IMG. IMG is, in, in, in my head, IMG is kind of the bones or the structure in which I want to uh, mimic. But going back to the conversation we had earlier about preparing people or kids for life, mm-hmm. and being able to throw different scripts. I, I, everybody in this room, including the cameraman, EPs in here, you probably what, went to art, music, what, whatever your electives were, right? Yeah. I want my electives to be coding. I want the electives to be something with technology, how to work a camera, <laughs> how, to, how, to, how to edit, how, to, how, to, how, how, to, how do I edit my music? How do I you know, control the, the board in the, in, the, in the controlling room? How do right. I engineer? Like, this is the new script I want to be able to give kids, because. I think the old interests and traditional interests are changing now. Kids are more interested in how things work, how to create things. People are more creators. Uh, people are, I'm finding uh, everybody wants to make content and take yeah. pictures these days. So I'm, I'm just, I'm going in that direction. I'm, I'm going in the wave of throwing script and some imagination to grow the imagination. Hey, no, go ahead. How are we, the culture, meaning, you know, minorities, right? How are we into, you know, um, Celebrating the brick phone and, 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 you know, being the masters of the phone. But no, it's no black technology companies out here, bro. How? In 2023? It ain't a black technology company out here? We don't own a phone? How, bro? How yeah. is there not a black company that don't have a, a phone? There is. You know what I'm saying? So, like, even that, when we were talking to Freddie Fingers, right? Like he, he, What's he, the name of the black phone? No, no, no. He had a company, a telecommunications company. Telecommunications and so That's what I'm saying. we, we had to like do the research on him, and he started. It started out with him trying to create a device so he can keep track of his grandfather, who was hearing impaired, mm. and that started his evolution in technology until he ended up creating his own telecommunications company. But nobody's talking about him, and so we can you can create the academy, but what's equally as important is who's facilitating the lesson, yeah. right? Because these teachers, if they're not culturally responsive, yeah. right, then it won't matter. It won't matter because they won't get it and they won't find the importance in it, wow. right? When you, when you see, like even in Florida, I've just seen like they're, they're, they're banning like learning about African-American history. Like it started at, in, in schools and taking it out. It's yeah. like, well, all right, well that, now we got to create our own thing. But like if we don't know our history, we're going to repeat it, right? And so it's about who's facilitating it because if, if they create a, a, an aura where it's receptive, then you're going to be intrigued. Like when they're talking about Paul Rivera, it's like, oh, wait, who is this dude? I gotta figure this out, right? But the problem is, like, a lot of the teachers and educators, they don't have, they're not eager to do it anymore. Mm. They're looking at, and I learned this by being inside of it. This, it's not even about kids. It's about the, the people who are teaching it. I watch kids, like, especially now you got kids. I'm checking third grade math, and I'm like, this is how they teach you how to add? Like, we used to add, it was just one plus one is two, and this is how they teach you how to subtract and divide. I'm like, well, why are they changing the way that you are learning how to add and subtract? And then it hit me. I'm like, imagine you taught 25 years and you taught the same thing every year. You go insane. And so to keep it fresh, I got to keep changing the way that you're going to teach it, which in, impacts the way that his kid and my kid are going to learn it. Mm. It's like, this isn't even about kids. Because I could teach my kid how to subtract. I know how to do it. I know how to divide. Why are they showing you? The, it's not about the kids. It's about 
who's facilitating, and how they're going to keep it fresh when they teach it. Because if they don't, they'll get bored, they'll be disinterested, and that's going to affect overall learning. What's the most common thing people ask y'all? Look like, at my portfolio. Yeah, <laughs> look, look at my portfolio. It's very common. Um, how'd you get started? Um, like, what are some tips? The, the tips thing is always the biggest thing. What's like, the number one tip y'all give people? Be consistent. Word. That's an be thing. original and be consistent. That's, that's can can I pick your brain? Yeah. Can I pick your brain? People hit, hit you with <laughs> just that. Just sit here. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Let's give this all away right now. You, you got an hour? <laughs> like, wow. Just a spare, right? Yeah. <laughs> can I pick your brain? Are y'all on 24-7? People think y'all on 24-7? Yeah, for sure. But we, know, This is who matter. we are. Every but day. it's dope, though. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, to yeah. me, it's because it's, it, I feel like it's encouraging, especially when I see, like, it's be the most randomest places, bro. Like, <laughs> I remember I was in, I was going to my car one day. It was like in a, in a garage, and I seen this dude. Like he was a street dude, and he was like, "Yo, yo, bro." I'm like, he like, "Yo, look at this. Look at my stocks. Am I doing a good job?" I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like yeah. nah. So It'd be like that. it just shows you, like you know, like I, it was never like that before. Yeah. Like you know what I mean, so um, even though sometimes it does become a little overwhelming, like we always try to like always accommodate people, take pictures, answer questions because we know that like it could potentially change somebody's life. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we met, we was in L.A. actually a few years ago, and um, <clears throat> these guys from Chicago pulled up on it. They're like, yo, yo. They're like, yo, earn your leisure. They ran down on us. It's like, yo, I started an Airbnb, and I was able to quit my job. They're telling us the whole story about I put my man on, and now he's running the Airbnb for me. So I just feel like, you know, when you can actually help somebody make money, mm. like, and help somebody change the way that they think about themselves mm. and help somebody provide for their family, it's really a blessing, so I feel like we've been we've really been blessed tremendously. Yeah. So it's, it's it's all good. That, that goes back to that part. It's like, do we have to go to a certain place in LA, or could they just watch it and that impact? Like we won't know the, the ramifications of it, but it's true. And it's not just our community. Like you said, like I was coming out of Lifetime Gym. Right, dude runs up. I'm thinking I'm in this like he banged my car. Out. I'm like, yo, what happened, bro? He's like, yo, I just want to tell you this. I'm a broker, and I'm watching. Like, I'm watching this. I know you guys do it for your community, but, like, we're learning, too. Like, we work on Wall Street. We're watching what you guys are doing. Because we say the things that they can't. You know, like, so, like, how Cam and Mace can say the things that analysts can't? Like, we're doing that in finance. And it's like, wait, they're giving away everything. Right? So, like, that puts them in jeopardy because it's like... Because they're leveraging it. (laughs) Yeah, they look at, like, wait, hold on. These guys really know what they're talking about, and they're giving the game to the people. That's why I said, like, this is really a revolution because... There is no end to it because you don't know the, the legs to it, right? Somebody in Kuwait is listening. Somebody in Tokyo is listening. Somebody in Durban, South Africa is listening. Somebody in Lagos is listening. And that one piece of information changes their life like that. When y'all ready to start your channel, y'all come holler at me, all right? Nah, for sure. And then if you, ever, if you need us for your school, too. Hey, listen. We did. That, let us know. Less than six months. Y'all going to be knocking on the door like, yo, we ready for the channel. I see where y'all going. And that's it. KG certified. We out. Oh, man. Thank you guys, man. <laughs> nah, I appreciate it, bro. Seriously, bro. Nah, that was dope, man. Straight up. That was dope. When you're authentic to who you are, everything else will fall in place. People are going to love, they're going to hate, but you never know who's watching. Everything I do, I want it to be as original as it can be. Somebody did it like this, I'm going to do it this much filler. Who comes back and rescues himself? This was our moment to let people know how we felt as a team. We've revolutionized this game with our influence.